you're, you're so you should see the emina introduction yep. slide yep excellent okay let's wait for a few people to come in So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's Emina. Today we have Ken Witherly speaking on a short history of Helitem. And we were just discussing that Ken is our first repeat speaker. So far we only had sort of unique speakers. Uh, and Ken spoke in December 2020 in the during the first season and now is giving a, a second Emina. So those of you who think or are thinking that they might have something new since they last spoke, please get in touch with either um, Lindsay, me, or Alan, and we will be happy to, to slot you in. Um, I'm sure by now you all know how things work. Uh, the main page to get everything related to MNRs is the MTNet page where you can register for future events. You can see the presentations and the YouTube videos of previous uh, talks. So you can browse through now three seasons of MNRs. Um, we have a few more this season, so three to be uh, no, two, to, pre to be precise. Uh, next week, we have Maxim Smirnov talking about the DREX, DREX project, which does deposit regional scale exploration. Um, and then on the 21st, we still have an open slot. So if there are any last minute uh, takers, please get in touch. Uh, and then on the 28th, so three weeks from today, we have our sort of end of the season event, which is an open mic, uh, open discussion for up to two hours and on anything you might uh, think is important for MT. Um, it would be good if you can send in topics beforehand. We, we do have some possibility to react spontaneously to, to new things that come up. But if there's something where you think, okay, this definitely should be uh, discussed, then uh, please get in touch with us and we will make sure that we will cover this. Um, and yeah, as I said, today we have Ken Witherly talking about Helitem. Ken is with Condor um, Consulting and he has a long history of um, well working in geophysics and, and EM uh, since he graduated from uh, UBC in 71, so a little while ago, uh, and uh, yeah, has been working on different aspects of EM, and he's going to talk about the airborne side of that, I suppose, today. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Ken. Thank you, Max. Um... So the the topic uh, it, the Heli Tim is is not any particular one company's brand, although that name has been applied to some of the technologies. But with events, uh, some of you would be aware. Uh, some of the original uh, people involved in the uh, development of a helicopter time domain EM. Um, have are no longer with us uh, or are fading away, as we say. And I thought it would be appropriate to look at what the industry has uh, received from these developments, in terms of technology, uh, how it's uh, somewhat how it's being applied, and sort of put put the story into a framework that sometimes really only time allows us to appreciate. Uh, looking at things in in and uh, in, in a snapshot at a particular time is is always interesting to see the details, but we tend sometimes to miss the fact that a lot of these things uh, take a long time to develop. Many people are involved, often many companies, 
and the end products are often not recognizable from what they originally where they originally started. So in doing this and uh, uh, this, I su suggested that maybe one of the one of the earlier uh, individuals who aspired to reach into the sky and uh, uh, be sort of uh, godlike was Icarus. Uh, he's towing a small magnetic sensor here as his feathers are uh, discombobulated. Sorry, Ken? Yes. We can't see your slides. You, I took over the sharing, so I took it away from you. You, I think you're referring to things that were on your title slide, right? Uh, yes, the title slide. Yeah, yeah, but uh, we can't see that yet. You have to do the oh, share okay. again. Okay, give it back to you. Okay, hang on a second. Um, is that is that okay? Yeah, now we can see. Ah, yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember this. Not, I thought, okay, um, <laughs> makes more sense when you see it. Well, there's there was actually one gentleman uh, uh, I did some work on earlier, uh, Hans Lundberg, who reported that at some point he was so infatuated with with airborne geophysical sensors that he uh, assembled some sort of paraglider. This is in the 1920s. And and uh, with some a, a geophysical instrument attached, and then leapt off a cliff, and uh, he he managed to for, have the good fortune of hitting a tree, which uh, prevented him from uh, probably ending his life at that point, uh, very early on in his career. And he went on to do many great things. So we see Icarus with similar dreams at an earlier time. So I'm going to give a short history of where. Uh, airborne EM first came from uh, before moving into the time domain side of things, since uh, it all happened really relatively recently. And the first example of, of uh, uh, I guess, call it real. Okay, I need to get this slide. There we go. Did you see a change in slides? Yes, looks good. Okay. Yeah, I just had to figure out what, what one to push. So this is a part of a patent application uh, that actually Lundberg filed in 1940 for uh, the, the first real version of an airborne survey, a hybrid. In this case, it looks like what I think end up being called commercially uh, tour air style, where you have a, a grounded transmitter and clearly, there's a small aircraft in the in the uh, in two parts of the picture, showing both a plan and a sectional view of what you may be able to achieve by energizing the Earth with uh, uh, some frequency domain signal, and then flying an electromagnetic sensor in an aircraft above it. Uh, this technique. To uh, in the record seems to have, while first defined in in uh, 1940, was not used until the 1950s. I have not been able to find any actual examples from Lundberg, but certainly he was thinking about something that would be the first one. In terms of the actual first flying airborne electromagnetic system, we have an image here. It's the only one that uh, is is available of a Bell helicopter in 1946, which themselves were quite new at the time. And the contraption you see, uh, it's not just a big uh, tape deck or cigarette lighter, it's actually uh, an airborne EM system inside the bubble of the helicopter. This system was flown by Lundberg uh, for a period, we believe about a year. It wasn't particularly effective. The depth of investigation was was limited to, uh, we, we believe, five to 10 meters and required the helicopter to fly fairly low. But it was the first one on record. And this then resulted in an effort by Lundberg, uh, funded in part by an American oil company, to put together uh, a fixed wing airborne EM system using an Anson aircraft, you can see the transmitter loop wrapping around the nose of the aircraft, uh, the inside. And this, this system was built in the late 40s. 
And in 1950, uh, Lundberg actually presented results of flying over a deposit in the Sudbury Basin. Uh, this actually gave him the record for the first successful airborne EM flight. Um, the records are a little confused from that time, and they show a, a group uh, centered around McFar and, and the company Inco, at the time now Valet, as having built the first operating system. Lundberg's was actually about a year ahead, but it was kept confidential by the petroleum company, and very little information came out about it at the time. The uh, interesting drone-like thing on the left is actually a toad EM bird. In those days, they made them out of uh, mahogany. And that's, those pictures are from the uh, earlier SEG museum, uh, the physical museum that existed back in the 90s. And that, uh, that device is still, still exists. But the, of course, the, system is, the systems have changed markedly. Very important uh, to this exercise was the work that a gentleman, James Waite, did. This is a page of his PhD thesis from 1951, where he began looking at the fundamentals of EM induction and put a framework in place that a number of other groups at the time took advantage of and started applying here in this case here, we can see a, a, a dipole energizing the earth, setting up a field in a, a target in the earth, and then a receiver over here. So this is the embryonic start of using geophysics to map remotely uh, conductive bodies in the earth. Uh, the patent in this case was uh, filed in 53 and granted in 1956. But uh, Waite is certainly was one of the major pioneers in developing the theory that was used for building then airborne EM systems. He also looked, Waite also looked at the time domain aspects of it, uh, charging, discharging, what sort of signal was available. A lot of this was recorded on things like oscilloscopes at the time. Uh, pen, uh, pen chart recorders and such, uh, seemingly primitive, but certainly were effective in finding some of the early deposits. Getting things into the air start, usually started with some hybrid approach. Ground systems, of course, existed for a long time, but this was a, an effort uh, by the McFar group in the mid-50s to get to the point where first towing something on the roof of a Jeep, and then getting an actual bird ready to go with a transmitter at one end and a receiver on the other. Uh, so we got frequency domain going, of course, sooner. Uh, but then quite shortly after that, Tony Berenger was able to get a time domain version uh, of an airborne EM system functioning. This picture was uh, uh, probably taken in, a, in either 1958 or 1959. And by the early 60s, Behringer had a, a, a working system that was out uh, doing test work in, in North America and in Europe. To the, to the subject of helicopter time domain, the first system to appear, although it never, to my knowledge, came to North America, or did it seem that North Americans were aware of it, was out of the then USSR in 1967, the AMPP developed by the NGRI. And this is, <clears throat> this is documented uh, reasonably well, uh, but as they say, there, there seemed to be no effort on the part of people outside of the USSR to either borrow the technology or to mimic it uh, at that time. And so there was a period during the 1970s when technology like this and, and successor technologies, they had a series of like AMPP2, three and four were being used for minerals and in some cases for petroleum exploration 
inside the uh, Soviet Union. The first system that appeared in, in, uh, in the West uh, was developed by Questor uh, based around the input technology that Tony Berenger had developed. So that name uh, attached to the being called the Questar input system. And it's a very impressive piece of technology. And if any of you are helicopter aficionados, you'll, you'll recognize that's a Bell 205, also in the military parlance called a Huey. Uh, it's quite a large a helicopter and quite expensive to operate. And that spider web system is, is quite heavy, hence the 205 was required. And the external boxes, the large one here on the, um, on the left side of the aircraft is the uh, uh, ge uh, power generator. Since the transmitter uh, loop was drawing more power than the helicopter had available to, uh, to pull off its own turbines. So this system operated for about uh, three years uh, and then a combination of market conditions difficulties inside the Questar company uh, and the high cost of the technology resulted in uh, this system um, being decommissioned. But interest was high. A number, uh, a number of companies were continued to look at development. Aerodat was at the front of this and they actually built in the first part of the 80s and published on a, a two component time domain system uh, nicknamed the truth system. Of course, we always know that geophysics only tells us the truth. It's just a matter of what that truth actually means is usually the ch challenge. This system, unfortunately, was uh, doomed never to actually get into commercial uh, production. Uh, it was decided by the then new owners of the company when they came in in the mid 60s that this technology was really not something they wanted to support internally. Uh, no companies at that time were, were funding uh, projects like this. And so the, the, the system was decommissioned, uh, but in the way often it works in the business, the same company uh, five years later had an interested commercial party come in and they um, uh, rebuilt the system, which we'll see momentarily. But there's always some interesting little side projects. Uh, in this case, in Australia, there was uh, curiosity on the part of a number of people in, in uh, mining companies about the possibilities of using a blimp as a platform for time domain. Uh, this was carried out in, in 1989. It was, this, this blimp was actually uh, operated as part of a, a media circus by a, a rich industrialist named Bond. And they uh, flew a loop attached to the blimp with a towed receiver. They were using um, Star Syrotem technology which was a homegrown uh, form of time domain EM, ground time domain EM. And they did a series of, uh, they were traversing between Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, they went over a known deposit. They did profiles as well as stationary uh, stop start style and obtained anomalous responses. But given the complexity of the system and the cost of the of the blimp to operate, uh, that trial never never uh, went further along. Although a number of years later, De Beers did adopt uh, the blimp technology to carry a gravity gradiometer for a period of time. To my knowledge, an EM system was never remounted into into the blimp. This is the second generation at uh, Aerodat. Um, an Australian company at the time, uh, they've now vanished, bought up by Extrata, uh, but that was MIM Mines, and they uh, funded a project with Aerodat to build a two-component uh, transmitter system. Uh, it got assembled, it got a test flight in, or several test flights, 
you can see with that ladder for scale, it's a very big piece of equipment. Uh, also required, I believe, a 205 to, to operate. And uh, it came at a time when, when the business in the 1996, 97, uh, there were significant uh, global economic issues. And in the end, this technology was also pulled apart. But during this time, um, there were several individuals who saw the vision of a helicopter time domain as something which was probably doable, but maybe on a less grandiose scale than flying a blimp or, or uh, very, very heavy systems which required big, expensive helicopters. Uh, one of these pioneers was Wally Boyko. Uh, he came up with what he called the Aerotem system. And you can see here the, the system hanging below, in this case, a, a reasonable sized helicopter and something that could be considered uh, possibly economic as long as it could produce some reasonable data. So Boyko was certainly one of the uh, top entrepreneurs, technologists who assembled a team to build a functioning uh, time domain EM system. Uh, another, uh, arguably uh, one of the most uh, uh, entertaining characters in the field was uh, a, a Frenchman who moved to Canada, Bernard Kramer, and he developed called the Them system. Also around the same time, he had actually worked for Geoterex and was the designer of their transmitter for their uh, geotem system. But then he turned his, his attention to uh, a towed EM system for time domain. And he probably, to me, had the most elegant system of the bunch, uh, where he actually had a transmitter slung below the helicopter. But the EM coils were actually carried in a, in a blimp uh, that trailed behind. And uh, this was, a, I think, a Photoshop version of it. You can see the transmitter sitting here. Again, a reasonable sized helicopter. And the blimp with the receiver is uh, being towed behind it. I believe his exercise was the only one where this sort of uh, combination of transmitter receiver using a blimp was actually employed. Um, some of the companies also were intrigued with this. Anglo-American, of course, was best known for their work on the Spectrum system, which is actually still in existence, but they built a heli TEM system in the early 2000s. Uh, you can see the transmitter is that kind of uh, diamond-shaped piece at the, uh, at the front of the bird and the receivers at the back. Uh, apparently, it didn't get a lot of uptake within the Anglo group. Uh, and when it uh, uh, had a uh, um, close encounter with the ground, uh, the system didn't get rebuilt. So interesting technology, but uh, a lot of things, uh, you need people to stick with it and see the value. Otherwise, the uh, um, these programs just stop. Uh, Newmont came into the into the story in the mid '90s. Uh, there it was a little more complex because they worked closely with an Australian company at the time called Normandy. Uh, Newtem was the version of the technology that Newmont implemented. Uh, they they over a period of about seven years, seven eight years, they did a number of surveys on projects around the world. Their companion uh, company, Normandy, was steered by Graham Boyd, who developed that their system, which was went by the name of Hoistem, uh, and both had strong similarities in appearance between the Newmont and the Hoistem. Uh, Hoistem and a variant is still operating uh, in Australia, uh, but it has not done much work outside Australia, it seems. Certainly, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to find any data from it in, in say, North America, but uh, it's still around. 
the one of the most, uh, I guess, iconic uh, kind of, a, I call it the Ford 150 version of helicopter time domain now is the VTAM system. Ed Morrison, pictured here in front of one of his frequency domain systems, uh, came out with, with uh, VTAM in 2002. Uh, we see the, the now the classic large transmitter loop, the spider web supporting it. Because without this, uh, these ropes to hold it together, all of these tubes are basically independent and would just collapse in a pile. So transmitter on the outside and some form of receiver in the middle. This got more complicated with time when they added a B field measurement, buckout coils and the rest. But this was sort of the original, like the 1964 Mustang. This was the original style of the VTEM, this being, of course, the magnetic sensor. Um, it was an interesting pursuit to find out with the case of VTEM where the original ideas came from with, with Hoistem and with Kramer. It was fairly obvious with, with VTEM. It was a little more difficult, but it can be traced back to uh, 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 this gentleman here in the middle, Peter Kuzman. He basically came into the geotech organization in around 2000 and basically took a pre-existing program at that time was called Scorpion uh, that had failed to put a, a, a functioning system together. And Kuzman, with the help of several other of his compatriots, were able to assemble uh, what became uh, first called Dreamcatcher and then the and then the VTEM, VTEM system. Kuzman that went, went on to develop the AFMAG system that Geotech has, and he's also worked with this gentleman, Andre Bagaransky, who have also started another company called Expert, and they in turn have both their own AFMAG as well as a new time domain EM. So Kuzman is arg arguably one of the most prolific designers and uh, uh, of airborne EM systems uh, that we've um, been able to find in our in our business and uh, certainly to his credit for what he's been able to do. SkyTem came out of Denmark uh, based originally around work uh, done in that um, for groundwater purposes with ground EM and they felt that the technology could be effectively lifted into the air to achieve similar goals, but faster and cheaper. Uh, they first started to show up around 2003. There was uh, a number of entrepreneurs got into the game. This one was Mo Moment Tem, 2006. A uh, gentleman by the name of Daryl Curley uh, put this system together. Uh, Fugro finally kicked in in the mid 2000s, 2006. They had their version of a heli geotem. Uh, it didn't last too long, and was modified to end up looking very similar to what uh, the VTEM system uh, design is. Uh, Le Mosquito hybrids of the Them, uh, working with uh, a branch of the old McFar company, 2008. So you started to get a plethora of knockoffs that were similar technology to the Aerotem, uh, to the VTEM, and the THEM uh, appearing in the, the decade that followed. This came out in, in May of 2011. And I believe a version of this is still operating. Sometimes hard to tell what's actually being slung from helicopters. This was the next generation one that uh, Fugro had put together, and they actually used the name that Aerodat applied to their 1990s project. This got uh, put on to their version, which looks a lot like a VTEM system, but was flying the Fugro flag. And then the last one I came up with was the uh, NRG's Excite system in 2020. So we have a, a, a long run in. To get the technologies going, uh, we ended up, uh, you know, the first first successful one, uh, the AMPP, early on in the piece, uh, and it took the 
developers, particularly in Canada, although there were some, some work in Australia and in South Africa and obviously in Denmark with the SkyTem, it wasn't until uh, 1992 that we saw the heli input arrive, then the truth uh, develop, but never went commercial. A blimp was just an experiment. Uh, the heli-TIM in 1996, uh, similar to truth, was built, trialed, and then uh, abandoned. But finally, we got the top, uh, the, say the top three that emerged, the them, the aerotem, and the VTEM all kind of clustered in the next couple of years. And then what I call post-2002, really the herd, a number of similar technologies from a variety of groups, usually some airborne company. In the case of Denmark, it was uh, funded in part by the, the government uh, and, uh, and, and worked with academia. But we have a lot of choices that <clears throat> came to pass in that post 2002 era. So when you look at the, at the flow of technology, uh, the very beginning there was um, airborne EM systems built in the 1940s and the 1950s through to about 1963 with, with the input system. But then the, the wave of from 82 to 2005, I've nominated as the era of age of Helitem because of just the, the, the enormous effort that a variety of people in the industry put into getting these technologies to, to function properly technically and also be, importantly, commercially viable. Because without that, uh, very few things will survive uh, very long, at least in the, in the private sector part of the business. What did the this second wave provide us? Uh, I think we can certainly say that the helicopter time domain systems were capable of a superior signal to noise over what was available at the time, which were uh, originally analog and then digital fixed wing systems. Uh, the toad bird systems that are popular with the fixed wing always have a, a bit of a challenge with uh, wind noise and such on the receiver. Uh, the helicopter designs provided more rigidity and better signal to noise. Here's a, a comparison of uh, data from a, a mining company flown in 2004. So very early days with the VTEM. It had only been out for two years and it was being put up against the Megatem system, which was considered at the time the gold standard of airborne EM. You had a, uh, at that, in that year, you had a 2 million dipole moment available with Megatem, uh, very significant. And yet the uh, uh, strap-on system that the VTEM represented uh, was able to generate results that arguably were as good, if not somewhat better than what the Megatem was capable of doing. Here we have in the Athabasca Basin conductors at great depth, 450 meters on the left and 750 meters on the, on the right. And uh, so people started to pay attention to the helicopter time domain as being a viable alternative, in fact, potentially a superior alternative to traditional technologies. <clears throat> Here are several more uh, examples. These were all put out at the time and, and available, but it's certainly uh, these sorts of results had a strong, made a strong impression on the industry as to the importance of helicopter time domain. Spatial recovery, um, this of course is in part taking advantages of improvements in GPS technology, but the helicopter being more of a point source was easier to, to understand in terms of how that position location could be used and it allowed the industry to move uh, or remove uh, the historic need for ground follow-up uh, of EM and it basically was the death nail for things like uh, the Max Min horizontal loop EN system and, and a lot of um, time ground time domain EM in the upper couple hundred meters now could be undertaken with the uh, helicopter time domain systems. 
This is from uh, 2005, uh, geophysicist Sharon Taylor with, with Naranda Falconbridge at the time. They had a major program in the uh, Bathurst camp of New Brunswick, major base metal camp. They had reflown the entire camp with Megatim, and they went in and used VTEM to provide surgical strikes on various targets. Uh, you can see the black lines in the picture here or the Megatem flight lines, and then their VTEM set up here. So they were beginning what we, what we branded inside uh, my company, we called it fly to drill. You could actually get high enough resolution of, with the data to go in and drill actual drill holes. And so we went from uh, anomalies like this with the Megatem here, on the upper, the middle and the upper panel over a conductor <clears throat> highlighted by the uh, magnetic response. So it's also magnetic. But then you look at that response there from the from the VTEM and you have something which you can then put into modeling programs to come up with drill coordinates. <clears throat> These are the benefits that uh, Taylor indicated in her presentation at the PDAC. Uh, improvement in time. You can get more targets assessed quickly than ground would allow. Access around the year, data density for modeling, minimize topographic effects, and lower cost. Global deployment. Um, uh, one of the things that we realized early on was that with the helicopter time domain, you basically could almost FedEx an airborne EM system anywhere in the world. Now, of course, you still have customs issues, but you don't haul a helicopter around. You simply find a local helicopter to use, and you've got your six or seven, uh, six boxes that you, you know, go get it from the air freight office, take it to your field site. This is actually in, in the Carajas of Brazil. Uh, and this technology was sent down from Toronto took a matter of you know probably a week to get into in country and then assembled put together up and flying in the normal 2 to 3 days whereas if a large fixed wing aircraft were to be used weeks if not months were spent with customs issues certifications military clearances and all all the rest of these things so helicopter time domain basically transform the ability of the industry to deploy wherever it wanted high quality uh, geophysical platforms that just was not possible in the past. And what happened to the what happened to the glorious fixed wing systems? Well, I happened to be there at the birth of it in the upper uh, upper left corner. It doesn't even have its formal Fugro paint job at that point. There, the center picture is in it's in its glory, and then in 2015, uh, yes, it was uh, sent to the scrapyard. So, yeah, quite a uh, quite a, a dramatic change in in how the industry uh, looked at airborne EM technology. But one of the challenges that we still face is that the these these a lot more kilometers have been flown. The data quality is better. All the things that um, Taylor cited in her story have been repeated hundreds, if not thousands of times in the last 20 years. Yet we really don't have that much better of uh, a track record in terms of actual discoveries. And it isn't, you know, the, the technologies, while there are some differences, by and large, they're offering the same level of improvement in terms of uh, cost, mobility, spatial uh, resolution of anomalies, ability to do direct drilling. So it means that really the test is how much further can we carry just using the conductivity parameter going forward to find new deposits. And one of the points I think that uh, uh, struck home with me was the comments that uh, Professor University, well, he's emeritus now, Gordon West, University of Toronto. He came up with a comment uh, back at a, a ASCG conference in 1997. And his point was the technology often solves a problem, but if the problem isn't the right one, then we actually haven't advanced the story. 
And this this paragraph to me is at the heart of where I think the uh, where we need to look at to turn with airborne geophysics is say one vital field um, is that maybe easily get lost in the rush for ever high higher tech geophysical systems the understanding the relationship between geological characteristics of earth materials and the physical properties that can be remotely sensed. This can only be improved by organizing, organized uh, systematic feedback from geologists who can measure the geological effectiveness or ineffectiveness of geophysical products, the geophysicists who design the geophysical methods and surveys, and hopefully understand the physics involved. So I think for a third wave, um, we really have to look at the West paradox as being something which needs to be included not just in what the technologies we're, we're going to be building or hope will be built or discovered, uh, but that we will think about it. Uh, when I first put this uh, together, I was aware of an interesting program um, that uh, uh, Newmont's been supporting in the form of active source airborne uh, MT or IP. And uh, Newmont kindly provided a slide of a system that's been going undergoing field trials in uh, New South Wales. It's a squid-based sensor uh, sits inside this uh, EM transmitter loop. Looks a lot like a uh, any of the Thames that uh, I've shown in the last uh, you know hour or so. Uh, but it's got B field uh, components sitting in here, so it's definitely in the world of high tech. <clears throat> There's a couple of um, Squid systems out there now. DS is deploying the um, uh, a magnetometer and an MT system uh, developed in Germany. They're providing that commercially as well as uh, now this new kit on the block. So stay tuned. Uh, there'll be more results. Obviously, um, hopefully interesting ones coming out from this system. But this could be one of what we could call the third generation technologies. Uh, that will hopefully be able to help us find new deposits, maybe at greater depth than before. But we have to keep the West paradox in mind. So that's it. Um, hopefully you found something of interest and I'm happy to field any questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Ken. That was very interesting and uh... Certainly, there are already, already some questions and, and some comments. Uh, so I think others have felt the same. Um, so I will get to those now. So Tundebello, thank you, Ken, for the ex excellent presentation and taking us down memory lane. Do you believe that HTEM may still be improved upon, or do you believe that we have reached its potential? As as a conductivity mapping technique, um, there does not appear in the, uh, the, to my understanding, on the theoretical side, something which we have not been able to acquire. Uh, although there is an interest, for particularly, and in in part of this could be dragged in from the critical mineral story, then in the case of the search for magmatic nickel deposits, we tend to find that they're often associated with very high conductivities that are challenging for much of our conventional uh, off time or even integrated B field measurements, largely because of the base frequency that we're forced to be using traditionally, typically uh, 25 or 30 Hertz systems. Whereas we know with ground systems to be optimized for nickel searches, frequencies of less than one hertz are desirable. Uh, I'm aware of some work, uh, proprietary work. One company has invested in a, in a very low frequency um, system receiver, but I haven't seen any results, nor, nor do they, uh, one thing large companies typically now do is if they have a new technology, they'll, they'll try and entice people with ground that they're attracted to to come in in some sort of joint venture. So the one major provides a proprietary technology, the other major provides or junior is access to ground that uh, somebody else wants to work on. 
So there is a, uh, I guess, call it a, a poser out there in terms of getting lower frequencies routinely available to deal with targets of very high conductance. Uh, but it's kind of a niche area that you may find that it may be quite expensive to acquire that data and, and you might have other ways of, from an expiration perspective, you might have other ways uh, to address that. So, but otherwise, um, we've, we've uh, I think the technology has plateaued in terms of its capabilities on its original design. Uh, we've seen, you know, it's cheaper to fly Traditionally, we're getting we've displaced a lot of the ground geophysics we had to do historically. The timelines are are shorter. We don't have to look at going out on frozen ground to acquire data in the same way. It's uh, uh, we have a lot of benefits, but most of them have probably accrued to the survey companies because their technology is better, faster, cheaper to operate. And the clients often don't really see that as a primary advantage uh, because they often don't see the cost drop dramatically. They're just, they're always having to foot the bill. So yeah, leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, and then there's one from Bill Thuma. Thuma. Ken, would you co comment on the news Kuzman development mobile MT? Well, the uh, we understand for reasons of, of potential conflict with patents uh, that of uh, we understand apply the first you know cab off the rank as it were was the uh, ZTEM or ZTEM system of, of Geotex. Uh, Kuzman was obviously aware of that uh, and so chose a design that is somewhat different than how the ZTEM acquires data. We've worked with both. Uh, we It's like anything, if you've got 10 years experience with one type of data stream and only a year and a half or two years with another, uh, certainly our level of, of um, comfort working with data, we're still seeing more things coming out of the expert data that we have to develop our skill sets around because we just haven't seen that much of it. So uh, I think in the end, the two are, are we tell clients that they're pretty compatible, uh, but we also tell them if you say, well, we've got a, over a decade of experience with one technique, uh, we're a little more comfortable with it, but it's not it's not saying that the other system is, is uh, has a shortcoming it's were the issue it's our experience that's that's not as robust so we like the clients to know that what you know it's like a surgeon have you done uh a thousand heart open heart surgeries or five um for us expert is more we're in the five heart surgery category so i'll leave it at that yeah um then there's a question from Sergio Espinosa. Uh, what system has proved to have the largest moment? Perhaps the AMPP? No, the moment on that was actually fairly low because they they didn't have a lot of power available in the helicopter. Uh, that would have changed with time. And, and I think in, in general, you see that that if somebody wants to focus on a high dipole moment, uh, that's possible uh, to add that capability. What, what we perceived as one of the benefits that the VTEM system had early on is that their signal to noise kept getting better, but they really weren't raising their dipole moment that much. What they were doing is they were dealing with the fundamental noise issues surrounding their, their receiver. And they have developed a very sophisticated, we understand, we only, we only have seen inside, call it the box so far, and the rest of it's proprietary, but they definitely went through a process of 
uh, reducing the vibration noise, which ultimately controlled the signal to noise far more elegantly and far probably far more cost effectively than simply raising the dipole moment. Yeah, thank you. And then there is some activity in the chat. Most of it is just saying thanks for, for the presentation. Um, there is one question that I'll read out. So it's Dan DiFrancesco. So ev evolutionary changes and improvements in sensors will no doubt continue. But what do you see as the revolutionary change for the future to raise the EM capability? Well, it, it, that's that's often the question, right? What's what is the disruptive technology? <laughs> who who has the idea uh, and to put something into play that really nobody else thought of, um, like the the work with the um, uh, airborne uh, IP that uh, Newman is supporting. Uh, you can go back ten, at least ten, if not more years and see discussions within the community uh, when the original uh, inductive source negative EM responses were being examined by a number of groups. Uh, we, like I'm sure a lot of companies, we were presented with calculated uh, airborne IP responses by different contractors we attempted to make some sort of expiration use of it, but it ended up not contributing in any meaningful way that our clients were prepared to support. And so we kind of moved on. The, the, but the version that, that's being operated now had its ideas that probably even back into you know 2008 or earlier uh, and now re is reaching fruition. So we kind of saw that train coming. Uh, it just took some time and money uh, and the right people to come together to, to realize it. Other things that we haven't thought of, uh, this is in a way the technology stream almost drives itself. Uh, the people will come up with different approaches, but whether they're gonna be effective or not, it kind of gets back to the, to the West paradox is like, well, it isn't just, you know, how fast you fly or your dipole moment or how many channels you have uh, or how good your inversion program is. If you're stuck with the same parameter, there's really not a big story by just tweaking it around the edges. It seems that we have to look at integration with other data sets. Uh, we have to look at uh, uh, measuring things that we haven't measured before. Uh, can we measure them? And we, we, do we even know where to look to find the, those signals? I mean, this is uh, the, the muon guys are, are one of the few that are pushing that particular envelope. Uh, but gravity is tricky. Um, it often tells you things that you're not very interested in, and that could dominate your signal. It's, uh, it's one of those things it's not that cooperative uh for a particular problem that's why we like active source systems right give you something you know diagnostic you control the the energy that you're putting into the earth and the waveform the frequency and you get something back that is it's not quite seismic data for sure but we can do more with it so i'm i'm open to suggestions as to what people think might be possible is it no, is there is something that's going to come out of a university lab? Uh, you know, just somebody came up with a with an idea that just hadn't been out there before to do something. Quite possibly, historically, that's that's often what's happened. Yeah, and certainly that uh, West paradox that you've sort of, sort of mentioned a few times and mentioned now, I think, is at the heart of things. Right, we need to understand. Uh, a conductive signature what does it actually mean right because you can drill it and it can be an, uh, any number of things um and if it doesn't translate into success then all the the fancy technology sort of doesn't really help us uh i mean do you have any concrete sort of ideas there sort of what what would be like the, the most urgent things is it like 
petrology, you know, taking samples of, of different materials and knowing better what to look for? Or is it the is what you mentioned now the integration with other data sets that you get velocity and conductivity or density and conductivity? Or where do you see like the the most urgent need? Well, I think the 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 petrophysical side of things is is a subject that uh, uh, some in, in the industry have spoken of for a very long period of time and but it doesn't it doesn't seemingly get traction uh at least with the the part of the community that that pays bills uh and i think that probably an example of of one where we where the community missed something uh quite important uh, I've been uh, uh, part of this kind of historical interest side of things, but in terms of where we're going, relates to the um, uh, petrophysical behavior or character of chalcosite, which is normally associated as part of a, a, a super gene weathering process in many copper deposits. And the fact that chalcosite, as uh, Don Emerson, who's a preeminent uh, petrophysicist, worked decades in Australia, um, now retired, he published a paper on the conductivity of chalcosite in preview, uh, showing that <clears throat> if with the, with the quality of the chalcosite, as it improves, uh, the density increases and the conductivity increases. A series of field trials was carried out in 1992 in Chile by Quantec. <clears throat> and this, this showed that a number of these chalcosite blankets, super gene blankets, were very conductive. And it allowed basically uh, the company I worked for at the time, BHP, to design major airborne geophysical programs uh, trying to take advantage of the conductivity of chalcosite to allow flying to be carried out as opposed to arduous ground programs that both from a commercial as well as technical perspective were almost impossible impossible to carry out in the in the Atacama desert. Um, flying was challenging enough. So but when you look around, uh, super gene blankets have been, probably one of the most significant economic components of many copper deposits because of the ability to process those ores far more cheaply than uh, the standard primary sulfide ores, often referred to as the hypogene, or uh, the chalcosite, the supergene is, is, say, you make a lot more money out of that early on in a, in a deposit. And yet the geophysical community effectively ignored uh, the whole issue. And so in, in, in a way, the West paradox was like, you could point to that and say, Here, here's an example. We still, we still haven't uh, uh, addressed this issue in a, in a, in a thematic way to, to get back to the geologists and be able to say, we actually, have something that's important that we historically missed. And what else are we missing? And I think at the heart of it, it's we have to be more, much more thorough with how we're dealing with, and it's petrophysics, but it's not at the micro scale, but more the macro or the meso scale that we have to start to build because this is the scale mineral systems exist at. Uh, and and uh, Emerson, actually, I sent him a note after I read this paper, which I only found a couple of months ago. And uh, he says, yeah, he says, there's, there's a whole bunch of things need to be done that just haven't been done on this. And it's been sitting there, number of issues with a number of deposits. We really don't know that much about the petrophysics of how those behave. And if we don't have that in hand, how can we design technology to exploit those? Um, we're, 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 we're just, we have to take that first step forward and really become comfortable, I think, with, with understanding what uh, uh, rock properties, mineral properties are. So, 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, there are no more questions in the Q and A. Lindsay, do you have questions, comments? Just want to say thanks, Ken. This is a great overview, and um, really appreciate again highlighting the, I guess, the perennial problem of connecting geology and geophysics. But to have some ideas of you know concrete areas and concrete um, questions to perhaps focus on is is really exciting. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Ken, and thank you, yeah. everyone, for attending. Uh, next week, we have Maxim Smirnov talk, also talking about exploration, the D-REX project, which is a big European exploration effort, uh, I think mostly ground uh, EM, so sort of tightly connected to the discussion today. And yeah, until then, have a good day, have a good week, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Stay safe. Cheers. Bye. Thanks.